This episode of Tales from Ostlantis is brought to you by Ostlantis Premium. Don't you just hate having your favorite podcast interrupted by ads like this? Well, dear listener, you're in luck. Because starting at just three bucks a month, you can support independent Chicano media and receive ad-free episodes, premium episodes, bonus content, and access to our Discord server. Just visit talesfromastlantis.com and click Go Premium, or follow the link in the show notes. And now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite weary. This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, and 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 why that's so. Yali no chime, and welcome to Tales from Astlantis, the show where we explore Mesoamerican pseudo history, New Age nonsense, and other stories of adventure. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa and Ruben Ariano Tlacateca. A couple of years back, I visited the British National Museum in London, England with my wife. As we stood in front of the many Mesoamerican artifacts on display, objects that the hands of our ancestors had meticulously crafted, I was reminded of a scene from the Marvel film Black Panther. Now, if you've seen the movie, I'm sure you remember which scene I am referring to. In it, the character Eric Killmonger Stevens, played by Michael B. Jordan, stands in front of African artifacts at the fictional Museum of Great Britain. The museum director soon approaches and offers to tell him where the artifacts had originated. After listening for a bit, Killmonger interjects and notes that the Fula tribe did not make a 7th century warhammer in Benin, but rather... It was taken by British soldiers in Benin, but it's from Wakanda, and it's made out of vibranium. He then adds, don't trip, I'm going to take it off your hands for you. When the director retorts that the artifacts are not for sale, Killmonger responds, how do you think your ancestors got these? Do you think they paid a fair price, or did they take it like they took everything else? Soon, The curator has collapsed to the floor. Killmonger tells her that she should have paid more attention to what she was drinking rather than to the gallery's suspicious black man. He and his team, posing as EMTs, charge in, take out museum security, and escape with the artifact. This scene caused an interesting discussion in the archaeological community and among museum professionals when the movie first came out. In an essay titled... Why Museum Professionals Need to Talk About Black Panther, Casey Hogan of John Hopkins wrote that Black Panther presented the museum as an illegal mechanism of colonialism and along with that, a space which does not even welcome those whose culture it displays. Now, I'm not going to lie. Part of me wished that I had my own team of highly skilled Nawa operatives with me at the museum in London and that we were there to pull off a carefully orchestrated heist, liberating the objects of our Mesoamerican cultural inheritance and returning them to the land of their birth. Unfortunately, such acts of daring cultural restitution are the stuff of pure fantasy, more at home in the Marvel Cinematic Universe than in the real world. Or are they? Well, buckle those seatbelts, dear listener, because on today's episode, we delve into a little-known story I like to call Rescuing the Tonalamat Aubin. For this episode, I will rely on multiple newspaper accounts, particularly the New York Times article, A Stolen Relic is a Problem for Mexicans published August 29, 1982, and written by Alan Writing, along with information provided by the website Mexico Lore. 
The Tonalamat Albin is a Nawa codex consisting of 18 screen folded pages. It is constructed from 13 bark pieces that were pasted together and is meant to be read from right to left. Its contents include the 260 symbols representing the Tonalpuali, or count of days in the Mesoamerican timekeeping system. These symbols are broken down on each page into sets of 13 days, known as trecenas. Originally 20 pages long, the first two pages have been long lost to time. It is best described as a calendrical document of divination and appears to have originated in the Puebla Tlaxcala region of Mexico. Experts believe that it was copied from an older pre cuauhtemoc era document. The Albin first appears as Calendario Idolatrico, or Idolatrous Calendar, in the inventory of ancient Mexican manuscripts owned by the Italian aristocrat Lorenzo Boturini Benaducci. Boturini was sent to Mexico in 1736 to collect the 1,000 pesetas owed to one Doña Manuela de Oca Silva Moctezuma, a descendant of Moctezuma Xocoyotzin, who sought to claim her overdue pension. While in Mexico, Boturini amassed an impressive collection of rare and precious codices and manuscripts, including items from the collection of noted Nahua historian Alva Ixtlil Xochitl. In his own words, Boturini described the value of his rapidly growing collection as exceeding all the mines of gold and silver in the country. However, due to his propensity for shady dealings, Boturini was arrested on January 31, 1743, his precious collection confiscated and an inventory made of its contents. Broke and penniless, Boturini was expelled back to Spain only to have his ship attacked by pirates (laughs) (laughs) who managed to steal his last few possessions. This is one unlucky dude. The (laughs) The items in Boturini's collection were soon dispersed across Europe, bought, sold, and traded among various collectors. According to the website Trafficking Culture, At that point, the codex passed into the hands of the local colonial government that sold the document. A portion of the codex, pages 9 through 20, seems to have been sold in or after 1802 from the estate of Mexican astronomer Antonio de León y Gama to two traveling artists, Carl Nebel and John Frederick Waldeck. It is possible that Nebel purchased the Codex, then sold it to Waldeck, and then Waldeck sold the Codex to Joseph Marius Alexis Aubin in Paris in 1841. Aubin eventually obtained pages 3 through 8 of the Codex, but it is unclear when and under what circumstances. The complete document was purchased by Charles Eugene Espidon Goupil in 1889, along with 383 other Mesoamerican manuscripts from the Aubin collection. The Alban Tonalamat was then donated to the Bibliothèque Nationale de Paris by Goupil's widow in 1898. It was there, in Paris, that the Tonalamat Alban appeared destined to sit in relative obscurity among countless other Mesoamerican artifacts. However, all of that would change a mere 84 years later. Enter the Mexican. On Friday, June 18, 1982, a 36-year-old Mexican journalist and lawyer sat in the French National Library, hereafter referred to as the BNF, in Paris, looking over some Mesoamerican codices. When he had finished, he returned the wooden boxes containing the illustrated parchments and left the building. Days later, library officials discovered that one of the documents, the Tonalamat Albin, was missing. José Luis Castañeda del Valle of Cancún, Mexico, had presented credentials to the National Library and asked for permission to examine the codices as part of his research. Once alone, he hid the Tonalamat Albin on his person, returned the box it came in, and headed straight to the airport. 
Like all great heist stories, there are different versions of how he managed to get the Albin out of the National Library. According to the website Mexico Lore, he had been aided by the fact that the Codex was stored, as many such precious manuscripts are around the world, in its own bespoke box, which he calmly handed in empty along with the other materials at the end of his visit, having concealed the original under his jacket. Or was it a sarape, as some claimed at the time? Frank suggests that he cunningly swapped the original for a fine facsimile, the edition by Carmen Aguilera, which conveniently had just been published the previous year. We'll probably never know. For the record, the BNF lists Aguilera's facsimile edition in its manuscript holdings. Library officials immediately called in the local police, but Castaneda had already slipped out of Paris. Interpol in France and Mexico soon became involved, and Castaneda was eventually arrested at his home in Cancun on August 16, 1982. He surrendered the Tonalamat to the Procuraduría Federal de Justicia. Did I get that right? That sounds good that to me. That was a hard one. <laughs> and claimed that he had intended all along to hand the Codex over to Mexican authorities. The French embassy demanded the return of the Codex, but Castaneda stirred up a wave of Mexican nationalism by asserting that he had rescued a piece of Mexico's cultural heritage that had been stolen from the country more than a century before. Newspapers argued that extradition of such a Mexican patriot was surely out of the question. He told one reporter, it was stolen from Mexico, and now we have recovered stolen property. However, the fact that he kept the codex at home for two months and only handed it in when arrested made many suspect that he planned to sell it on the lucrative antiquities market. Ultimately, only Castaneda knew his true intentions regarding the codex. Inevitably, a diplomatic fight broke out between Mexico and France the former portraying Castaneda as a hero and the latter labeling him a common criminal. One person's hero is another person's smuggler, right? <laughs> the event tested the strongly nationalistic views of both countries regarding questions of cultural heritage and national identity. After French officials had publicly denounced the financial and intellectual imperialism of the United States, only a few weeks prior to Castaneda's rescue of the Albin, France struck a decidedly different tone when it came to themselves. The return of part of a national patrimony to the country of origin is a different issue, argued Pierre-Henri Guinard, spokesman at the French embassy. That can be discussed and negotiated at the UNESCO, but here we're dealing with a common crime. Our reaction is the same as Britain with the Falklands. There was a theft, and we cannot accept the theft. Another foreign diplomat said that any decision by France to drop the case would set a dangerous precedent. Can you imagine the Greeks trying to steal the Elgin marbles from the British Museum? The Italians trying to steal the Mona Lisa from the Louvre? And so on? He asked. It could be chaos! <laughs> Sounds like my kind of chaos. The French historian Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie, director of the BNF in the mid-1980s, refused to allow any Mexican to cross the threshold of the library ever again. <laughs> God. I wonder if he um, ordered one of those signs from the United States, one of the right. no Mexicans or dogs allowed. No Mexicans, no pets, <laughs> uh, no dogs. No cussing, no fussing. <laughs> he could have uh, bought one of those signs from Texas. And he demanded the return of the manuscript on a legal basis. It had been in the BNF since 1898, donated by Eugene Goupil's widow in accordance with her husband's will. Eventually, the two countries would come to an agreement that allowed France to save some face. The Tonalamat Albin was symbolically handed over to Roberto Garcia Mol, the director of INA, Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History, by Pierre Chérès, a high-ranking French diplomat. 
French officials agreed that while the document legally belongs, quote unquote, to France, it would remain on permanent loan to Mexico. And to this day, the Tonalamot Albin rests in Mexican hands, returned home by a daring young reporter named Jose Luis Castañeda del Valle. Here, here. Yes. So <laughs> it's, it's interesting because when I first saw Black Panther in the theater and the scene happens where he's like in the, in the, the museum, which is obviously a stand-in for the British National Museum, and takes the artifact... I wondered to myself, like, I wonder if, if one of the uh, the writers was aware of the story of the Tonalamat Albin and was inspired by that to uh, to write to write this scene, to create this scene. So if I ever meet one of the writers of Black Panther, I'll have to ask them that question because it's, it's a little similar. Yeah, there's some parallels there. And it also makes me wonder, where's the movie for this one? I mean, this is an actual yeah. thing that occurred. Yeah, this is real. I mean, and it's someone, someone's asleep at the wheel over there in Hollywood. Or what do you call Mexican Hollywood? What's that called down there? Do you know? I don't know. Do, do, do they have a name for it? I know, Chicano I mean, Hollywood. Of all the, should be called Chalewood. Or Chicano Hollywood. Someone, someone needs to, yeah, exactly right. Chalewood. Chalewood. <laughs> someone needs to shine some more light on these kinds of stories. I mean, people like going to see uh, 007 and uh, what's the other character that's similar to that? International Jason Spies Bourne. and Jason Bourne. Why not Chicano Bourne? Right. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this story is prime to be made into a film because it's pretty amazing. I mean, if you look at it, it's unclear whether he faked his credentials to make himself appear as a student um, because that's one of the rumors that I had heard while doing research for this episode. But then he went into the museum over the course of a few days and started trying to ingratiate himself to the staff there and start to gain their confidence. In fact, some people think that his original plan was to take the uh, Paris Codex, the Maya Codex mm. held at that library. And... um he made a lot of visits to the library to gain the you know confidence of the staff, but for whatever reason, he wasn't allowed access to the Paris Codex. So, you know, he, he went in and he just asked, well, what can I see? And well, are his credentials in, in question? Like, do we know what he was? He a student somewhere at the time? Was he a journalist? So he was a what, um, what's his background? So Jose Luis Castaneda del Valle of Cancun, Mexico, was I'm quoting from the website Mexico Lore, which everybody should check out because it's a really good website. Uh, it sure is. He was one of 19. In fact, uh, you wrote for them, didn't you? <laughs> I did, didn't yeah. I? I forgot about that. <laughs> so it's a uh, it's a little piece on on the concha guitar that the concheros use. You might want to check it out. Yes, look for my name. Absolutely, just uh, get on Mexico Lore, and there's a search function. Just search for Ruben Arellano Tlacatecat, and you'll have a really cool story that he wrote. But according to Mexico Lore, Jose Luis Castañeda del Valle was one of 19 lawyers who founded the Barra de Abogados de Quintana Roo. So I guess the I think it's called Quintana Roo. Roo? I think that's how it's pronounced. Okay. Yeah, Roo. Well, that's, at least that's the way I've always heard hey, it pronounced. You're probably right, man. And he presented... Let's see what he says. Okay, here we go. Initially, he had been refused permission by the head of the historical manuscript section to see and photograph any of the original codices in the BNF. But as he claimed professional status, including as a journalist and provided photo ID and proof of his home address in Cancun, Mexico, permission was subsequently granted. On an impulse, hmm. he recounted later to the Mexican news outlet Noticiero uh, 24 Horas. I don't know how to say 24. 24, 24 Horas. horas. <laughs> I actually remember that show. If, if you thought that was bad, wait till you hear this. Decidí yo al siguiente día traerme el tonalamat o libro de la Buenaventura de origen tolteca o azteca. So. I wonder, what, if, was this guy associated? Do we know if he had connections to any Mexicanistas? To the MCRCA? Well, maybe not necessarily the MCRCA, but a similar type organization. Yeah, you know, that's a good or, question, man. I, there's actually not a lot of information available on Jose Luis Castañeda. Um, I've searched, believe me. It's, when I first heard this story, 
I try to do like a deep dive to find out everything I could about this guy. I've only been able to find one photograph of him, and it's from a still of a TV interview on Mexican mm -hmm. TV in 1982. That's the only image I've been able to find of him. So that's a good question. I wonder, I wonder if he was a Mexican operative of some sort. I mean... For there to be so much secrecy around this guy and for him to just be able to travel to Paris, France and steal a valuable codex that way. I mean, it just seems maybe. I mean, stranger things have happened. Yeah, right. But, maybe I mean, he was I on wonder. a mission. He was on a mission. You never know. You heard it here, folks. Conspiracy. <laughs> we have just begun the conspiracy <laughs> theory of the Codex Tonalamat Albin. We'll be back after a quick break. Have you picked up your Mexica calendar for the year 12 Flint? Or how about a paperback copy of The Four Disagreements? Just visit talesfromastlantis.com for all the latest merchandise and show some love for your favorite podcast. That's talesfromastlantis.com for all the latest merchandise. Now, back to the show. But, um... What's interesting is the fact that, you know, he held on to it for a while, for like two months, and he only handed it over when he was arrested. And that's what led some people, especially the French, the French were like, he's no hero. He's just a common thief because he was going to sell it on the black market. But they could have been playing that up to make their case as to why they wanted to get it back. But it makes you wonder, two months, that's a long time. I mean, if you have the Interpol immediately chasing after you and you've already boarded a plane and as soon as you land, he was interrogated apparently, right? Yeah. Am I correct yeah. on that? Yeah, that, I did read that, yeah. How is it that he's able to keep the Tonalama after he's been interrogated, after he landed yeah, it for is two fishy. more months? Because it sounds like he was right? trying to wait for the heat to die down before he started looking for a buyer, perhaps. I mean, in Mexico, when he lands, who's interrogating him? Who's in charge of that? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, was it like the old school customs where you give him a mordida and then you go? Or That's a good question. I mean, I, mean, I would imagine. That's, that's kind yeah, of this what was it the 1980s. Because they would have confiscated this if this was something, especially of, of international proportions. Uh, in the words, you're dealing with foreign governments at this point. It's not like he's just smuggling to sell something across the border or what have yeah. you. I mean, and this is a major at this time, artifact. Well, at this time in Mexico, the, uh, the market, the black market for stolen artifacts was huge. I mean, it still is, but particularly in the 1980s. I mean, this was 1982. In 1985, you had the heist at the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, where those two guys just planned it all out, went in there and stole like a bunch of artifacts and immediately started trying to get them sold on the black market. There's a really good movie about that, by the way. It's called Museo. It was made in uh, 2018. And uh, it stars, what's his name? Gael Garcia Bernal. No, oh, he's in it? Yeah, it's a really good movie. Is he like the Samuel L. Jackson of Mexican actors? <laughs> I mean, that guy's in everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, in the 80s, there was this market. So much so that if you look into this book called Faking Ancient Mesoamerica, they go into this whole market for fakes. So communities, small indigenous communities started churning out fake artifacts right, yeah. and selling yeah. them to European or, or whoever, collectors, foreigners, basically. telling. Well, this happens also in, in, in South America, I believe. Um, the people who believe in, in the whole UFO, oh, yeah. ancient aliens, like they go down to South America and there's like certain people down there that make these artifacts. They know that, that these gullible Americans or foreigners are that are looking for quote unquote evidence of ancient aliens will buy this stuff up and bring it back and see here's evidence because such and such farmer out in Colombia or Peru or wherever you know found this when they were digging up dirt yeah yeah like, well okay the, some of the most famous ones are the Ica stones right from exactly from Peru and they have like dinosaurs on them with like people riding <laughs> them right. on sa uh, right. <laughs> saddled dinosaurs with like people riding them. It's like the Flintstones come to life. Yeah. But in stone and in ancient stones that, that aren't ancient. <laughs> yeah. So you had these farmers that were that were making these, you know, as evidenced by the Ica stones, it, it ran the gambit. Right. So you had people who were trying to fake legitimate pre-Qualtemoc artifacts 
saying that, well, we found this while digging in our in our land and it's a symbol of Tlaloc. Meanwhile, you mm-hmm. have other people like the case of the Ica Stones where they're carving images of Fred Flintstone Dinosaurs. riding a Brontosaurus <laughs> and selling it to people. <laughs> Who are taking it back and now you'll see this stuff on like ancient aliens and all these shitty uh, YouTube faux documentaries about UFOs and forbidden history and stuff. So, you know, if you come across any of these, they're fake, dear listeners. So please don't buy into. I'm not saying it was Flintstones, (laughs) but it was Flintstones. (laughs) And, you know. When I was at the uh, the British National Museum in there, I mean, this museum is insane. You know, it's massive. They've got a moai. They have a literal moai. If our listeners don't know what a moai is, if you've ever seen the, the giant stone heads from Easter Island, those are referred to as moai. They have an actual moai near the uh, Captain Cook exhibit, which... How did it get there, Curly? Was it aliens? <laughs> Well, Captain Cook was see, a, uh, see, that's, a goddamn that's thief. Evidence. That's how they got That's there. evidence <laughs> that the aliens were, were, were in Easter Island as well as England with, you know, the connection with Stonehenge and all that. Obviously. So so this Moai, it's, it's an actual Moai, not a replica yeah, of it's, a Moai? Yeah, it's a real Moai that, that's there. It's a small one. It's not like one of the larger ones. Uh, it's a smaller one, but it's pretty impressive. And the, I guess the point I'm trying to, to make is when I was in the Mesoamerican room, they had Maya Stila on display, but the Maya Stila were replicas, right? And they were mm-hmm. no less impressive than, you know, the actual stuff that was on display there. And it got me thinking like, well, what's wrong with if a museum is able to repatriate these cultural artifacts back to where they came and just display replicas and then Mm -hmm. contextualize them and, you know, still give the history of them. But personally, as as an archaeologist, as an indigenous person, as a Chicano, Mexicano, I think that if you are going to see examples of a people's cultural inheritance, you should have to go to their place of origin to see them, mm-hmm. unless they're on loan, right? I mean, there's obviously exceptions where we could loan out a, a collection to be toured around the world so that people can appreciate this culture. But I think holding on to artifacts, especially if we know specifically where they came from and how they were acquired, I think museums need to take a serious look at themselves and, and think like, how much of this stuff should we, are we morally obligated to return? Well, I mean, that brings up a good question in terms of something that's closer to the Mexica community. It's something that we've kind of looked at over the years, the uh, the so-called Panacho de Montezuma. Oh, yeah. That's held in Vienna, Austria, right? Yes. Um, we have a replica that is, uh, we're in Mexico, is it in the INA? Or it's in the, exactly it's in the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City. Yeah. And a lot of people, they go down there and one of the pictures that they take is, you know, with this huge headdress that's like what, five, six feet wide or something. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's a gorgeous big. replica. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's it's beautiful. It's really well made. And the interesting thing about this Benacho at the Ina is that it's a replica of a supposed, and I say supposed, we'll get into that here in a minute, but it's a replica of a supposed actual Benacho that... It's questioned whether Motecuzama ever even wore it because yeah. apparently the history of this Panacho that's in Vienna, the original one, was a gift. What's one of those supposed gifts that were gifted to Cortes? I mean, that's I don't know if any of this is true. That's sort of the, the mythos behind it that it was gifted to Cortes on one of those original missions that Motecuzama sent to appease the Spanish as they're making their way from the coast into Mexico City. And as the story goes, Cortes. As he was receiving these things, he was sending them back to Spain as a way to justify what he was about to do in Mexico, right? Yeah. And so this was evidence of, look at all the luxurious goods that they have to offer here. Besides the gold, they have all these ornamental, you know, artifacts. And, well, they wouldn't have called them artifacts. What do you call them? Well, they had pieces of jewelry. They had featherwork. Yeah, you know, just... Just all this regalia that... Regalia. There you go. That the Mexica were, were... allegedly bestowing upon the Spaniards as gifts. And, you know, one of the thoughts behind this is that, you know, this was a show of strength. Like, mm-hmm. here is the grandeur of our culture. These, these, right. This is what you've just encountered. And 
instead of looking at the these objects and being like, wow, we could learn so much from these people. <laughs> he was shipping them back to Spain like, there's more where this wow. came from, boys. We can just take it. <laughs> and what I'm trying to drive at with this is that a long time ago, back in the, the late 1880s, there was a, a scholar by the name of Celia Nutal, and she wrote a piece entitled Standard or Headdress in 1888, and it was published in, I believe, it's... Uh, uh, it looks like it's the Peabody Museum of American Archaeology and Ethnology, and then it's just called Papers, Volume 1. Papers, Volume 1, right, 1888 to 1904. And this one specifically was published in 1888. And in that piece, she gets into the history of the headdress and she explains how uh, different people have described it over the years. And she traces back uh, the provenance of the headdress. Uh, and that's where the story comes from, that it was a gift that had been in Europe for a long time, since the very beginning of the invasion of Mexico. It was one of those artifacts that just made it through the centuries and, and is still with us today. But the question of whether it's the same headdress or if it's something different altogether is something for you, the listener, to decide. Because according to as uh, late as 1888, Zelia is saying that when they were looking at this headdress, when they were cataloging it and when they were preparing it for, you know, making it uh, possibly a, uh, a piece that could be displayed in the museum, they encountered the fact that the entire headdress had deteriorated so badly that the feathers were basically almost non-existent and all the original gold work had been removed over the years. All the gold, all the ornaments, all the gold threading that was used to piece all, all the feathers together and hold them in place had all been removed over the years and replaced with uh, non-precious metals. And even those were so badly worn that it wasn't worth even displaying the way it was. And so what happened was they ended up restoring it. They basically went back and looked at different codices to get an idea of what a headdress would have looked like. And based on these different codices and the images they and descriptions from the early chroniclers in Mexico, they were able to approximate what this headdress might have looked like back when it was originally uh, made. And so what we have now, even in Vienna, the only thing that actually remained that was original to the headdress was only the frame mm -hmm. itself. Everything else was new at the time. It was it had to be refurbished with new materials, new feathers. I don't even think they used actual gold in the remaking of this. I think it was still maybe brass or something or, mm -hmm. or a combination of, of different metals to create what we have today in Vienna. And the reproduction in Mexico is actually based on mm -hmm. a recreation of something that even by the late 19th century, people didn't really exactly know what it looked like originally. Yeah, the, the version that sits in the National Museum of Anthropology is a recreation of an approximation <laughs> of, <laughs> of something that they think could have looked like this. And what's interesting is in, I think, between 2010 and 2012, representatives of Ina went to Austria and did another restoration because mm -hmm. the version that was on display, they determined that it couldn't even be put on display anymore because it was so flimsy and fragile that representatives of Ina working together with Vienna's Museum of Ethnology got together and did another restoration. So it's like several steps removed at this point from the original from mm -hmm. the original. And, you know, a lot has been made about returning this uh, alleged headdress uh, the Penacho of, of Motecusoma, people call it, back to Mexico. But in reality, you know, it's really no different than the version that's currently on display. And the, the version that's currently on display is fine. I guess it would be a symbolic victory, you know, to get it returned. But even then, there are other, like as we've seen in, in the case of the uh, Tonalamat Albin, there are legitimate codices and artifacts with verifiable provenance that we know are authentic being held in museums and libraries across Europe. Why aren't we trying to get all of those returned? Like, why mm -hmm. specifically the Penacho? Like, especially knowing that it's, it's not even the real Penacho at this point. It's not the original. Well, that 
That's a very good question, Carly. I mean, I don't know if our listeners are familiar with a gentleman by the name of Choconochtle. What's his Spanish name? Something Is Gomara it, uh, Choconochtle. Antonio, I think. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to. I don't, I've got his book right here. I could check. <laughs> yeah, right. But going back to the 1980s, speaking of the 80s, uh, he was by the mid to the late 1980s, Shokonoshle was either traveling to Europe or had already moved to uh, to Austria or was is it is, does he live in Vienna itself or is it somewhere else um, I know he lives uh, in Austria I don't know if it's specifically uh, Vienna but he did you know what it's probably is Vienna because he does danza and holds right. protests in front of the Museum mm -hmm. of Ethnology all the time and he's been doing this since at least 1986 87 probably even before then so we're going back you know several decades now that this gentleman has been either traveling to Austria, living there, taking danzantes. The story that I heard from a danzante once uh, was that he routinely goes to Mexico to recruit in the Zocalo from different young people that are, you know, willing to travel. And, you know, he, he pays their, their, their travel expenses and, and, you know, puts them up in a place to stay when they get to Vienna and they stay out there for months at a time. And, and so the, the dancers that you see out there uh, protesting and doing the danzas are, are routinely um, sort of cycled through. It's never exactly the same mm -hmm. group of dancers from, from any one given time. I think this idea has slowly picked up over the years. And then Mexicanistas who have nothing to do with Mexicayo and they just have their own brand of national pride started hearing this notion of a penacho being abroad and there being some kind of effort that goes back several decades now and it, it's gotten to the point where now the you know museums are involved back mm -hmm. and forth in, in either restoring it or I think even like 10 years ago there was talk of uh, perhaps doing an exchange Vienna said we will give you back the penacho if you give us back the golden carriage of uh, Maximilian Maximilian yeah. <laughs> and Mexico's like, nah, we're going to hold on to that. <laughs> exactly. It's like, yeah, the, even Mexico knows, yeah, I think this is probably worth more than that penacho you got over there. <laughs> so, it, yeah, it would just be a symbolic thing. But, but you're right. I mean, instead of trying to re recover these symbolic things, why not actually try to recover things that are more meaningful, like codices? Yeah. And well, wh other why aren't artifacts? we trying to get the Dresden Codex back? Why aren't we trying to get the Paris Codex or the Borg? Or the other Boturini. Who has that one? Yeah, you know? I mean, th these are things that, you know, when I was there at the, uh, the British National Museum, I was seeing things that I had only ever seen photographs of in books. I mean, the turquoise dual-headed serpent, that's there. Like, I was looking at it. Like, why is this in London, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the most iconic pieces yeah. uh, from Mesoamerica, and it's in London. Why aren't we trying it's to get that back? So... I don't know, man. People don't want to hear the truth about the penacho because, you know, like you said, it's it's very symbolic, right? It's it's one of those things that I think the symbolism matters more to people than the actual truth behind it. But the truth matters to me. And what do you say about the truth, Curly? I say that the truth, it's like medicine, Dr. Ariano. <laughs> it might not always taste good, but it's always good for you. Ahí está. Timo y tase. Yo, we Mexico. <laughs> that was fun. It was. Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. 
Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. Thank you for listening to Tales from Astlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, Timoitase.